Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Meta Tamel. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm based in London. And this is the first time I'm here in Split and first time at Shift. And this is an amazing venue, first of all. I spoke in many different places, but I think I will remember this place. So it's great to be here. And I'm also amazed by uh, Split. I've been to Croatia one more time before, but it was Zagreb. And I think I like Split more than Zagreb. So <laughs> anyway, today we're going to talk about how, how you connect this little device called Google Home Mini, as you most of you know, uh, to Google Cloud. And how does that look like? Um, this is my Twitter. Uh, by the way, this stage is really big, so I might be running around. Uh, this is my Twitter uh, at MetaTML. So if you want the slides, I'm going to put them out there after my talk. Just follow me. And everything that I'm going to show you is already on Google Cloud Platform's GitHub page. So if you go to .NET Doc Samples, uh, Applications, Google Home meets .NET Containers, that's where the code is. So you can get it, and you can set it up yourself as well. So before I start my talk, let's see if my application is working. Uh, because this app that I built, I didn't publish it. So it's not out there. It's a test application. And to test that it works, we need to first of all ask uh, to get to our test app. And after that, we can check if it works. Uh, so let's do that. Hopefully things are still working. Otherwise, my whole talk will be quite boring. So, OK, Google, let me get to my test app. All right, getting the test version of my test app. Hi there. Can you greet everyone? Say that again. Oh. Let's say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. Great to be here today at Shift Conference in Split. Thank you. Goodbye. Hi there. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. I missed what you said. OK. Say it again. Sorry. Let's try one more time. Goodbye, please. I missed that. All right. So I will mute the microphone. So The mic's off. <laughs> I mean, this is a test app, and I didn't really test it that much, so you had to bear with me. But it will work, I, I promise, when we get to the interesting parts. All right, so what we're going to do, this is the application. So we have Google Home Mini talking to Google Assistant. So Google Assistant is the way you actually talk, uh, program these devices. And Google Assistant can talk to Google Home. It can talk to Google Home Mini. And it can even talk to your phone. So when you take your phone and use Google Assistant, you can, like, it will basically connect with Google Assistant um, system as well. Um, but then I'm also using something called Dialogflow. So Dialogflow, it's a framework to build conversational applications. And it has many integration points. So it has an integration point with Google Assistant as well. And I prefer to use that because it makes your conversational apps much more smarter. And then it's much easier to use than just Google Assistant. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, so some of the voices you can. Um, voice commands, you can handle them directly in Dialogflow. So when I say, let me talk to my test app, that's Dialogflow handling that. And when I say, greet everyone, it will also be handled within Dialogflow. Uh, but then Dialogflow can also hook to different places. So it can, talk to it can talk in HTTPS to anywhere. So what I did is that I set up a Google Cloud application. This is a .NET core application. Who are .NET developers here, by the way? Anyone? .NET, C Sharp? A few people. OK. But I mean, basically, it's just an endpoint running in the cloud. It doesn't have to be .NET. Uh, I use .NET because I'm a .NET person. Uh, it's running on Google Cloud, uh, on App Engine, or it can run on Google Kubernetes Engine. And then I, we did some integration with Vision API. So we added machine learning to our application that I'm going to show you some uh, samples of. And we also added some big data processing with BigQuery. Uh, and we'll also take a look at that. And then we are using Google Search, of course, to search for images. And finally, I have something called SackDriver, which is a monitoring, logging, debugging tool. So what we're going to do at the end of our talk is that we're going to try to crash the application and see if SackDriver helps us to see what happened. Uh, so through this application, I'm hoping that we'll talk about conversational apps a little bit with Dialogflow. Then we're going to talk about connecting that to the cloud. Then in the cloud, once the application runs in the cloud, it's not that exciting. I mean, when you have something running in the cloud, it's basically Instead of running on your machine, it runs on someone else's machine. But the power of cloud is that once it's there, you have all the services that become available to you. So you have machine learning available to you. You have big data processing available to you. You have stack driving and much more. So through this application, I hope to show you that 
you know, a cloud is a good place to put your applications because you have all these things that becomes available to you. All right? So let's start it. Uh, first of all, Dialogflow. Who knows about Dialogflow? Anyone? I can't see, but I guess it's not. Shout if you use Dialogflow. OK, one person. Great. So for the rest of you, let me explain what Dialogflow is briefly. It's basically a de developer platform uh, for building conversational applications. Um, and I was really surprised about it when I first used it, because I've been doing software development for 11, 12 years now. And every time I want to build something, and I think it's easy, it ends up being much harder than I think, because the devil is in the details. So once you get into the actual project and you try to do something, you realize there's all these details that you haven't figured out, and it becomes much harder than you think. Um, with Dialogflow, it was the other way around. I thought to myself, okay, if I want to build a conversational app, that must be really hard, right? Because I need to recognize people's voices, I need to be able to direct them to the right place, and then once I have that, I need to extract the entities, and then, then once I have the information, I need to feed that into somewhere. This can't be easy, right? But then with Dialogflow, it was so easy that, you know, even though Dialogflow is not my expertise, I, I started using it more and more, and I really like it now, and I want to, that's why I want to show you here. And Dialogflow, um, it has many integration points, so it works with Google Assistant, but it also works with Facebook, Twitter, uh, Messenger, and all uh, Skype, all these places, so you can integrate with whatever you want. Um, it works across devices, so it works with Google Home, uh, it works with your phone, it works pretty much with any kind of device. And it works everywhere. I mean, one thing that I really hate is that when a new feature comes out or when there's a new service, they usually make it available in the US and maybe some, sometime later in Western Europe. And you have to wait a long time by the time it gets to somewhere like Asia. And whenever I give talks in Asia, I, I give a talk about something, but then it's not available there. So that kind of defeats the purpose. But the good thing about Dialogflow is that it's available globally, so you don't have to think about that. And as I mentioned, Dialogflow has integration with Google Cloud. So instead of using actions directly, it's, in my opinion, it's easier and much more powerful to use Dialogflow, and that's what I used it. But if you don't want to use Dialogflow, you can also go directly to Google Actions as well if you want to. All right, so, and the power of Dialogflow is machine learning. So when you say something like, book a flight from Los Angeles to Hawaii for less than $300, you are saying a few different things. First of all, you're saying book a flight, then you're specifying two cities, Los Angeles and then a place, Hawaii. Um, and then you're also specifying an amount, right? Like $300. Um, Dialogflow figures out that these are entities. So it knows that this is a city, and it knows that it's a place, and it knows that it's an amount, and it extracts that for you so that you don't have to do that yourself. And you can actually feed Dialogflow some example sentences and tell Dialogflow, this is an example sentence that I'm looking for, and mark the entities that you're expecting so if someone says, book a flight from Los Angeles, and they forget to say Hawaii, for example, then Dialogflow will automatically ask that person, what's the second city or what's the second place? So you don't have to enumerate all the different ways of someone um, saying things. You just give a few examples, and you just show like, what entities you expect, and then Dialogflow figures it out for you automatically. So that's the machine learning behind Dialogflow that makes it really, really powerful. Um, so let me just show you the console first the dial of Dialogflow. So when you start a Dialogflow project, you first create a, what's called an agent. Uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. So this agent, um, you can think of it as, as, the, as the project or the application. You can have multiple agents doing different things. But in this case, I only have one agent called Google Home Meets.net agent. And in this agent, um, there's some settings that you can set, like what languages it supports, what machine learning settings that you have. Usually, I keep the defaults. There's uh, different versions of the API. Uh, V2 API is the latest one that I use. Um, but the important thing is the intent. So you want to tell the agent what it's supposed to do. And that's done through something called intents. Um, and you can have as many intents as you want. And there are some default intents. For example, if you look at here, there's a default fallback intent. So if I say something that uh, Dialogflow doesn't understand, it will get into this intent and then it will give some responses. So it says, I didn't get that. Can you say it again? But you can define what these te text responses are. So it's up to you to respond in any way you want. So that's the default intent. There's also a default welcome intent. So when I say, let me talk to my test app, it goes to this de default welcome intent. And in here, um, 
no, if we are just saying, hey, there again, like that's what I chose, but you can say whatever you want. Um, and then once you have this default fallback and default welcome intent, then it's up to you, whatever you want your agent to do. Uh, in our case, for example, we said um, greeting conference. So in here, as you can see, I'm, I'm providing some training phrases. So I'm saying greet conference, say hi, greet attendees. So I'm just giving some examples, but you don't have to give the full list. You just give a few examples and dialog flow figures out from that. And then the response is handled directly within Dialogflow. So in this case, we're saying hello, everyone, and then I, you know, it's good to be here at the SHIFT conference. So this, this is handled directly in Dialogflow. Um, but then it has integrations as well. Uh, so for example, if you look at this intent that we'll, we'll take a look at later, we'll ask like, what platform are you running on? And when, when we do that, then there's no response, but there is this webhook call. So we are basically enabling a call from Dialogflow to an external place. Uh, and that webhook is defined here. So if we come here, fulfillment, under here you, you paste the URL. So it's hard to see, but here we are saying this is HTTPS and it's an endpoint slash conversation. So this is an endpoint that I defined in Google Cloud that will, that Dialogflow will, the, we will go to the intent and from there we'll make a call to this endpoint and this endpoint will handle the request and basically send text back to Dialogflow, and Dialogflow will get that text and just say it, right? So this endpoint can do whatever you want, and we'll take a look at more detailed examples of this as we go along. All right, so that's Dialogflow. Um, as I mentioned, it has many integrations. In this case, I am not, uh, I'm just integrating with uh, Assistant, and there's entities you can define as well. So let's take a look at one of them with entities. For example, if we look at Vision, uh, this doesn't have entities. Um, vision search. So for example, this is, I'm gonna show you an example where we, we're gonna search images. And here we are giving some phrases. Let's see some dogs, dog pictures, images of dogs, stuff like that. But as you see, the dogs is marked. Uh, it's marked because I marked it as an entity and it can be anything. So in this case, the search term can be anything. That's why it's marked as sys any, and then this will be fed as search term. So what will happen is that whenever, whenever we are saying something, uh, this entity will be picked up and it can be anything. It doesn't have to be tech, uh, it doesn't have to be like dates or numbers or anything like that. And it will be fed to us as search term. And we can take that search term and we can do a search using that. So that's how you can mark entities in Dialogflow. All right, so that's Dialogflow. Um, let's go back to the application. So, this, uh, so we finished this part, and then now we need to talk to the cloud. Uh, for the cloud, I, I'm gonna have a .NET Core application. It's a .NET application running on Linux. It's running within a container, and we'll take a look at that. So that's kind of like the boring part of the talk where I have to explain, because we, once we have the conversation, we have to have the code to handle it. And then once we have the code handling it, we'll look at the machine learning and big data, the interesting parts after that. So what is Google Cloud Platform? So now I want to know, who is using Google Cloud Platform? Anyone? One person. I wish I had a t-shirt for you. <laughs> uh, so that's good, that's why I'm here. Uh, so Google Cloud Platform, it's basically a platform to build applications. So if you are using AWS or Azure, it's very similar to that. Um, so for compute, that, that's how you deploy your code. There's Compute Engine, App Engine, Kubernetes Engine, and Cloud Functions. I'm gonna talk about them in, in more detail later. For storage, there's Cloud Storage and, and for binary storage, big table and data store for NoSQL. Uh, there's Cloud SQL and Spanner for SQL databases. There's persistent disk. There's lots of networking options. I won't go through all of them, but basically load balances, VPNs, stuff like that. Uh, big data, so there's BigQuery, uh, which I will show in this demo. There's Dataflow for big data processing that's based on Apache Beam. There's Dataproc, which is managed Hadoop and Spark, and there's more, more stuff. And the ex exciting part for me is machine learning. So. There's Vision API, Speech API, Translation API, Jobs API. These are all like pre-built models that you can use in your applications. We can, we'll look at the Vision API. Um, and then there's Cloud Machine Learning Engine, which is a way to build your own models if you want to. Usually people use the pre-built models, but if you want to build your own models with TensorFlow, you can use Cloud Machine Learning Engine to train the model and to serve the model as well. And there's identity and security, and there's management tools with Stackdriver that I'm gonna show you, there's developer tools, and there's more. I need to update the slides. 
I won't bore you with this, but basically it's a whole platform to build applications. And you get $300 for free to try it out if you want to try it out. Uh, but in terms of deploying an application, there is a spectrum uh, when it comes to deploying an application. And this spectrum goes from highly customizable to highly managed. So if you want to have full customization of the environment, then you can go with Compute Engine. Compute Engine is what we call virtual machines in Google Cloud. You can have a Linux virtual machine, or you can have a Windows virtual machine with all the different flavors. And you can specify how many CPUs you want, all the way from 0 to 96 CPUs, I think. And then you can specify how much memory you want, how much storage you want. And then once you get the, get the VM, it's yours to maintain, it's yours to keep. Uh, and if you install anything on that VM, you have to keep it up to date. So it's your responsibility. So that's one part of the spectrum. And there's Cloud Launcher, which is a marketplace to deploy solutions to Compute Engine. It makes it easier to deploy applications on, on Compute Engine. On the other end of the spectrum, there's Cloud Functions. So in Cloud Functions, it's kind of like Lambda um, functions on AWS. You define a function with inputs and outputs, uh, and you define how that function gets triggered. Uh, it can be triggered by HTTP call, or it can be triggered by pop up messages, and, and many other ways. And once you deploy that, that function, um, that's all you do. You don't have to care about machines. You don't have to care about services. It's just a function you define and deploy, and Google manages it for you fully. Uh, so that's the other end of the spectrum. And in the middle, there's kind of like middle ground. Um, so there's App Engine, which is a way to deploy applications in a managed way. So you define your application with microservices. So you can have a front-end microservice. You can have a back-end microservice. You can have multiple microservices talking to each other. But you define your code and then deploy the code. And under the covers, Google manages that code for you on VMs. But you don't have to worry about the VMs yourself. It's managed for you. And then some people, I mean, App Engine is really easy to use. And that's how people start. But some people, they want more control with their containers. So they want to create a container cluster. And for that, there's an open source project called Kubernetes. And there's a managed version of that Kubernetes called Kubernetes Engine that you can use. So that's what people choose sometimes, depending on what they want to do. And then there's a way to build containers with Container Builder. And then there's a way to store your containers in Container Registry. So I just want to give you this overview so that when you're, when you're building your applications, there's this spectrum. So you, you need to pick and choose where you want to be and go with that uh, whatever you want to do. Now, since this is a .NET application, and since it's, this is a containerized .NET application, I want to briefly talk about containers and .NET. And this will be the end of the boring part of the talk, where I talk about how to deploy an application. Then we can get to more interesting parts. But I have to show you this, because your code has to run, right? Like someone has to handle the call from dialog flow. So, so that's why I'm doing this. Who is using containers today? OK, a few people. Um, when I talked about containers two years ago, no one knew them. Last year, many people knew them, and they started using them. And this year, I think everyone either using them or they think they want to use them. Um, container is, containers, they're basically another way of virtualizing your applications, but they're much more lightweight than virtual machines. Uh, because in, in a container, you're virtualizing the process and the dependencies of your process, but you're not virtualizing the operating system. So because of that, it's very small, and it's very easy to create, start, run, share with people. So that's why people are using it. And it became the standard uh, today to package your applications and, and deploy them and share them with other people. So if you're not using containers, uh, you will be using them eventually. Uh, so, you, so you should look into Docker and things like that. And when, you, when it comes to .NET deployment, um, if you're a .NET developer, you know that .NET world is kind of split into two nowadays. On one part, we have the traditional .NET running on Windows. And then we have the new .NET that's running on Linux, Windows, Mac, everywhere, pretty much. So if you're running traditional .NET on Windows, you can get a Compute Engine instance with Windows machine and deploy your application there. But if you made the switch to the new .NET uh, core world, you can take the core application. You can containerize it using uh, Docker. And you can deploy it to App Engine Flex or Kubernetes Engine. You have the choice there. App Engine Flex is the easy part. It's an easy way of deploying containers. But if you want to have more control, then you, will, you probably want to use Kubernetes. Uh, what does App Engine give you? Um, basically, in App Engine, you define your container, and you tell Google, this is my container. Just run it. I don't care how or when or where. Just make sure that it runs, and make sure that it scales when it needs to scale. And that's all I care about. Like, right? So if you, like that, if you like that model, then App Engine is for you. Uh, you basically just write your code and use gcloud app deploy to deploy your code. 
and by default you get dashboards, you get versioning, so every time you deploy your application you get new versions, you get traffic splitting, so you can uh, split the traffic between different versions of your application, and you get auto-scaling. So by default, your code runs on two machines, but then uh, it will be auto-scaled up to 20 virtual machines automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. And let me just show you, I deployed my application to App Engine Flex, so I just want to show you quickly how that looks like on Google Cloud. So this is Google Cloud Console, and all the products of Google Cloud are there listed here, but the one that we want to look at is App Engine, and in App Engine, there's a dashboard. Um, you can see like, things like latency traffic, VM traffic, things like that here. Um, you can see different versions. So in this case, I only have one version. But if you have multiple versions, you can switch between them. Uh, you can have multiple microservices in App Engine. In this case, I only have one microservice. But if you have multiple, you, you'll see them here. Uh, and once you have the different versions, now this one is getting 100% of the traffic. Uh, and it's, it's running on one instance. But this will be auto-scaled. So if more people use it, then it will be auto-scaled up to 20. Uh, and you can split traffic. So if, if you have multiple versions and you want to do A-B testing, you can come here and say, OK, I want to do cookie-based splitting and choose your version and slide to whatever you want and hit Save, and that's it. Yeah, uh, it will be automatically um, split between different versions. And then if you want to look at the actual VMs, you can come to Instances, and you can see that it's a Linux instance, and you can SSH into it if you want to. So that, uh, that's App Engine, and we're almost done with this part. But sometimes people want more. They want to be able to control more, because App Engine doesn't give you much control. You just deploy your code and let Google manage it. Uh, but there's a project called Kubernetes. Uh, anyone knows or uses Kubernetes? A few people, good. First of all, Kubernetes, as you can see from the Greek writing, it's a Greek word that everyone mispronounces. Uh, the right way of saying Kubernetes in Greek is Kubernetes. But Kubernetes, it came out in the US. And people in the US, they tend to mispronounce things, especially in Greek. So now we have this word that we are stuck with. Um, but it comes from something called Google Borg. So at Google, we've been using containers for more than 10 years. And we have an internal container management system called Borg. So people who worked on Borg, they learned from it over the years. And they created Kubernetes for open source people. And it's 100% open source. It supports multiple cloud providers, meaning you can run Kubernetes on your machine. You can run it on AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. So it's a good platform because it's open source and it runs everywhere. So once you adopt it, uh, it gives you freedom to run it anywhere you want. And I have to mention, um, there's a managed version of Kubernetes called GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine, that we make it really easy, basically, for you to run Kubernetes clusters. In GKE, to get a cluster, you just want to run one command, gcloud container cluster create, give your cluster a name, and boom, you have a Kubernetes cluster. And if you want to resize your cluster, you can say resize cluster, change size from three to five, and then you will have more machines in your cluster. So you make it really easy on Google Cloud. All right, we finished the boring part. Now comes the interesting part. Um, what I want to do is first, OK, our application uh, is running in the cloud on App Engine. And then we have Dialogflow sending requests to our endpoint. Uh, so far, there's nothing interesting. But what I want to do is I want to add some machine learning to my application. And then I want to do some big data analysis with my application as well. And that's when cloud becomes really valuable. First of all, in terms of machine learning, um, there's two ways of using machine learning. And, and I call it the easy way and the hard way. Uh, the easy way is you know, don't worry about machine learning. Don't worry about building models. Don't worry about data. Let someone else build a machine learning model and let them give you an API to use. So that's the, this part, using a pre-trained model. And if you can do that, if you can use someone else's pre-trained model, it's a much easier way of using machine learning, because you let someone else figure out how to train a model and how to give you an API that you can use. And then in some use cases, you have to actually build your own machine learning model, because maybe the pre-trained model is not good enough for you, or maybe you need to do some customizations. For, so for those use cases, you, have, you can use TensorFlow. It's an open source project. And then you, you can use Google Cloud Machine Learning Engine to, to um, train your models and, and serve it as well. I'm going to talk about this part, uh, the pre-trained models, because it's easier, and that's what I use in my application. In terms of pre-trained models on Google Cloud, so there's a bunch of APIs, like Natural Language API, there's a Speech API, Vision API for de detecting images, there's Video Intelligence API, and there's more APIs coming up all the time. What I want to show you now is the Vision API. So before I show it in my application, 
I want to just show you this demo. What we're going to do in every machine learning talk, you have, if you're showing machine learning, you have to show a cat picture. And, and, and then you have to show how well that machine learning model is working with the cat picture. That's the rule. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I passed in an image of a cat. And this image is passed to the Vision API running in Google Cloud. And what it gives us is basically just JSON. This JSON you see here, uh, that's what you get. But when we look at it graphically, we get some labels. So we got a label that this is a cat, 99%. And it's a pet, 99%. And it's a British short hair cat, 93%. So the Vision API figured out that it's a cat, but it's a certain British short hair cat. I'm not sure if it's true. I'm not a cat person, but I hope so. Um, and then it picked up the colors in the, in the picture. And it, it's also telling us whether this is an adult image or spoof image, so whether this image is safe or not, basically. So that's what Vision API gives you. Um, if you pass in um, some, some um, image with text, then it, it can also pick up the text. So in this case, this must be from Australia with kangaroos, I guess. Um, it, it picked up the fact that it's a sign, it's a traffic sign, but then it also picked up the fact that there's some text, and it will tell you where in the picture the text is, so you can pick them out if you want to. Um, and then the more interesting thing is when you pass in people, we don't recognize people like, we can't say this person is that, but we can recognize the expressions of people. So in this case, there's a social group, um, but if, if we turn this on, then it can detect the people's faces, and it can tell us if people are happy or not. So in this case, person one is very neutral, so I guess it's this guy, but then person two, which is this person, is joyful, which is good and person three as well. So th this is the kind of stuff that I can give you. And last thing that I want to show you here is if you pass in a landmark. So this is a baseball stadium in somewhere that I don't know. Um, so it's telling us it's a stadium. It's a baseball stadium, things like that. Um, it picked up the fact that there's a face, uh, this guy over here, who's joyful, which is good. Uh, but then it also picked up the fact that this is a city field stadium. So it's actually a stadium that's well known, and it gives us the Google Cloud coordinates or that stadium, and I guess it's in, um, looks like New York somewhere. So that's the Vision API. So how can we use this in our application? Um, what I'm going to do is basically when the request goes to, um, to App Engine, then from there we're going to make calls to Vision API. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for images of something using Google Cloud Search. Then once we get the images, I'm going to pass those images to Vision API and see what kind of information we can get back from Vision API. So let me turn the microphone on again, and hopefully it will behave this time. By the way, the mic's off. OK, to I know. To turn it back on, slide the switch on the back of Google Hub. The All microphone right. is back on. Let me talk to my test. OK, Google. Let me talk to my test app. Sure. Here's the test version of my test app. Hi there. Can we search? Uh, I want to use Vision API. OK, you can ask. Ah, what happened? Let's try again. OK, Google, I want to use Vision API. I stopped working. OK, let's try one more time. OK, Google, let me talk to my test app. All right, getting the test version of my test app. Hi there. I want to use Vision API. OK, you can ask Vision API to search for images first. What do you want to search for? Search for images of Split Croatia. Found some pictures of Split Croatia. Now, select a picture. Select second picture. Picture 2 selected. You can describe, show landmarks, or ask whether the image is safe. Can you describe the image? This picture is labeled Coast, Promontory, Aerial Photography, Coastal and Oceanic Landforms, Sea, City, Bird's Eye View, Bay, and Tourism. Are there any landmarks? This picture contains no landmarks. And is the picture safe? Let's see. This picture is fine. OK, goodbye. So 
Thank you. W what happened here is that um, when I searched the images, we used Google Search. Sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. I will mute it again because the mic's off. Good. Uh, yeah, it wants to stay in the conversation. You know, that's its problem. Um, so what happened is that when I said search for images, Dialogflow picked up the entity. It gave me the search term. Then I, I took that. I did a search on Google, got the pictures, and then from then on, I had the images. And then I passed it to Vision API. And when I said describe the image, it, we basically passed the image to Vision API, and that gave us the labels that it said about the coast and stuff like that. And, and then once after that, I said, is there a landmark? It did a landmark detection. There was no landmark here. And then when I said, is it safe? It, did a safety search with Vision API as well. And just to show you the code for this, so here I am in Dialogflow. So first, let me show you the intent. Um, as you can see, I have multiple intents, but then the Vision one are the ones that, that uses the Vision API. And the first one is Vision Intro. So when I say I want to use Vision API, that's where the, the, it goes here. And then all we do is we just do a text response. Okay, we say, okay, you can use Vision API to search for images first. What do you want to search for? And then I set that context. So the context is basically your, um, your application can have multiple contexts for different things. In this case, I'm basically saying when you're in this intent, make sure that we are in vision context. So all the intents with the vision context will be triggered now, right? So we are here. And then the first thing that I need to do is do a search. So that's vision.search. As you can see, the input context is vision. So that's how this gets triggered, uh, only after I say I want to use vision API. And then it also has an output context that I, I use it for other things. But here um, we have some examples. Let's see some dogs. In this case, I said let's search for images of split Croatia, right? So it's not in this list, but it doesn't matter because all Dialogflow expects is an entity, and it can be anything, right? So they, that's how it knows to get here. And then once it picks up this entity, it will give it the search term, and then it will be handled by the webhook. But the webhook is fulfillment. It's this endpoint. So this endpoint goes to my code in the cloud. And to show you the code in, that I have, this is Visual Studio Code. This is my code, and you can look at it on GitHub if you want. But I have a controller. This is a conversation controller. That's the main thing that handles the conversation. And when a request comes in, this is a request. It will call Dialogflow app handle request. So that's a class that I created. And if you look at Dialogflow app, it should be here somewhere. It will get into this get or create conversation. So what happens here is that we get the request. From there, we picked up a session ID. If this, se if this is an existing conversation, then we get that conversation. Uh, otherwise, we, it's a new session ID, so new conversation. So we create a conversation, and we add it to the list of our conversations. So that's, that's all we do. And then from Dialogflow up, it goes to the conversation. So if you look at the conversation, it goes to here, handle async method. And this finds a handler. So what this means is that now we are in the conversation, but we need to find the right class to handle the intent that came from Dialogflow. And the way we do that is that if you look at the intents, so I'll just look at one of them. Um, so this is platform describe handle, for example. There is a tag at the top that I mark it with intent. So this is the tag that matches the intent name in Dialogflow intent, right? So because of this name matching, that's how we find the handler. So eventually, we'll get to this uh, class. So for vision, there's a vision search. First, we need to search the image. So it will get here. And we will pick up the search term that Dialogflow gave us. And then we just do um, a search, custom search. So that's just Google search API that I'm using. We'll get some images back. And then once we have the images, all I'm doing is I'm doing Dialogflow up show and passing some HTML to show the images. And I also have another thing called Dialogflow app tell that will basically speak what I said. So in this case, we're saying found some pictures. All right, so that's all there is to it for searching images. And for, um, for actually like describing the image, so there's a vision describe handler. One thing that you realize, this vision describe handler, uh, at the top, it's using Google Cloud Vision API. That's on NuGet. So there's, a, there's an API for that uh, that you can use. But it gets here, and it gets to handle async. And we create a vision client. So this is the client that we'll, we'll use to talk to the vision API. 
And this is the magic. This is like one line. That's where the machine learning magic happens. So we say vision client dot detect label async and pass in the image, and that's it. You get labels back. So with one line of code, you are doing machine learning now. That's why I like to use these pre, uh, pre built models. Then we get the labels back, and we just talk. We just say dialog flow, just talk about these labels. And just briefly, landmark detection, it's exactly the same way. You get a client, you do detect landmarks async. One call, you get landmarks or not. And the safety handler, same thing. Come here, get a client, detect safe search async, and then you can determine whether it's safe or not and how likely it is that it's not safe, stuff like that. So that's Vision API. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Now, next thing I want to talk about is big data. So has anyone heard of BigQuery or used BigQuery before? One person. Oh, a few people. Okay, good, great. BigQuery is basically Google's massively parallel processing query, and it's amazing. You basically point BigQuery to some data you have, and usually it works better with larger data. So if you have small data that you can fit in a database, you probably don't want to use BigQuery. But if you have terabytes or petabytes of data, then BigQuery is perfect for that. So it will ingest the data. And then it has a lot of storage, and it has like thousands of machines where it can run the query for you. And the whole premise of BigQuery is that it returns, like it, you can search your data using SQL in seconds instead of hours or days. Like sometimes people spend like five, six hours just to run a query. With BigQuery, it becomes seconds. So that's what people use it for. Um, and what I want to do in this case is that I want to use BigQuery in my application and make some calls to BigQuery and get some information. And I just want to show you BigQuery first in the console. So this is BigQuery console. And BigQuery comes with um, some public databases, uh, public data sets. And for example, everything that happens on GitHub, we ingest it. So you can search anything on GitHub on using BigQuery. Uh, anything that happens on Hacker News gets ingested. Anything that happens like global temperatures on, of every country in the world since the beginning of time is ingested as well in a data set. So you can use these public data sets and run queries against them and see, see what you can get from BigQuery. And I think you can run um, queries of one terabyte for free per month. So it's free for one terabyte. So in this case, I was giving this talk in India. And in India, I was in Bangalore. And in Bangalore, there's two ways of saying it, Bangalore or Bangaloru, which is the Indian way. And I said, OK, let me just run a big query search that, um, that goes through Wikipedia page counts in 2016-5, so May 2016, and looks at the articles with the title that has either Bangalore or Bangalore. So I'm doing a regular expression match on all titles in Wikipedia from 2016 May. Right. So to run this query, I, this is a regular SQL. So if you know SQL, this is very familiar. The only weird thing is this regular expression you don't usually do regular expressions with SQL with big data sets because it, it blows up the whole system, but not BigQuery. So if you run this, now it's running. And let's see how long it takes. Yeah, so now these are the results. So we processed 220 gigs of data in 6.9 seconds, right? So that's the kind of stuff that you can get from BigQuery. Um, so what I did in my application is that I integrated BigQuery, and I wanted to look at global temperatures of every city, and I also wanted to look at some Hacker News articles on, in my application. So let's go back to my app, and let's hope that it will behave again. By the way, the mic's off. I know. The microphone is back on. Okay, Google, I want to search for news. I heard search for news. Sorry, I couldn't find any up-to-date oh, no. news. Okay, Google, let me talk to my test app. All right, getting the test version of my test app. Hi there. OK, Google, I want to use BigQuery. I didn't get that. I want to search for news. OK, you can ask BigQuery about top hacker news of global temperatures on a certain day. What was the hottest temperature in Croatia in 2017? Scanned 5,231 megabytes in 3.4 seconds. The hottest temperature in Croatia in the year 2017 was 40.1 degrees Celsius at the BRAC monitoring station. Well, 
what was the hottest temperature in the United Kingdom in 2017? Scanned 5,231 megabytes in 2.8 seconds. The hottest temperature in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in the year 2017 was 31.7 degrees Celsius at the Cranfield Monitoring Station. And what was the top hacker news on May 1st, 2018? Scanned zero megabytes in 0 0.8 seconds. The top title on Hacker News was titled, Amazon threatens to suspend Signal's AWS account over censorship circumvention. The okay, mic's off. that's why you don't want to use Amazon, I guess. <laughs> so what happened here is that um, you've seen how fast it is, and, and you basically can search anything you want. So you don't have to search public data sets. Even if you have your own data, you can integrate with it. And I just want to show you quickly how this looks in the code. So let's just um, go back to our code. And in here, we have Big BigQuery, and then if you look at BigQuery Hacker News, so when a request comes in, this time, oh, I should show you the intent. Intent is a little bit different. So if you look at dialog flow, and if we look at the intents, now if you look at the dialog BigQuery Hacker News, in this case, we are saying what was the top Hacker News yesterday, or a certain date, right? So I marked these as entities, this time, these are not any entities. These are system dates. So if you don't say anything that's date-like, then Dialogflow will correct you and it will ask you which date you mean. So that's how we pick up the date. And then once we have that date, we go back here. We get that date as a request parameter in here. And then just like before in Vision API, we had a Vision client. In BigQuery, we have a BigQuery client. So we get that. We construct our SQL using the date. We pass in the parameter, the date as the parameter, and then we show the query in the browser, and then we start a watch to time it, and then we execute the query, so that's one call. You get the result, and then if I have some results, I show the, show the result, and I also say dialog flow tell to say something. Um, and we also have some stats about the, the job, so that's where you get the stats. So that's all there is to it with BigQuery, and the same thing with the temperatures, again, in this case, the only difference with temperatures is that we, again, create a BigQuery client, but we are talking to a different uh, data set. So this is the data set that we are talking to. So we change the data set, but the rest is pretty much the same. All right. In the last five minutes I have, let's see if I have something else. Okay, so this is all fun and good, but you know, once you deploy these applications, you have to maintain them. So there's something called Stackdriver. Stackdriver is Google Cloud's monitoring, logging, debugging, error reporting, tracing solution. Um, so monitoring and logging, you know what it is. Debugging is really special. Um, in debugging, you can put your code on Google Cloud, and you can set breakpoints in live servers. And when the breakpoint gets hit, it takes a snapshot of the state. And you can look at the snapshot, but your code continues to run. So it's very useful for production level debugging. Error reporting is something where you can, uh, any errors that's thrown that you don't catch, they get reported here, and you can see some stats about them. And tracing is about HTTP tracing. So all the HTTP calls you, you make in your application, it will be traced, and you can take a look at them. So in this case, what I do is I tell my application to throw an exception that will throw an exception and kill my application and then we'll look at Stackdriver error reporting to see what we get back. So let's go back, and this is the last thing I'm gonna show. Um, so let's... By the way, the mic's off. To okay. turn it back on, slide the switch off. The microphone is back on. Okay, Google, let me talk to my test app. Sure, here's the test version of my test app. Hi there. Can you throw an exception? My test app isn't responding at the moment. Try again soon. So what happened, is, what happened is that it actually threw the exception, and that's why it's not responding. Uh, so once that happens, if you go back here, and if you go under here, stack driver, if you look at error reporting, you will see that we have some errors. And you see that there's some, some here that says just now. So this, this is the error, the system exception 
was thrown just now from this application, and you can see, you can believe me because it's version three, so that's the version of the application that I just deployed. And we can click on it, and you can get um, some stats about it, so it's only, we only throw it once, but you can see the stack trace, and if you, this, if this happens quite a lot, then you can see statistics about it, and you can even link to some issues and get people working on it as well. You can also link it to um, some calls so people can go get calls, actually, if this happens like quite often. So that's stack driver error reporting, and it's very easy to integrate. And then the other thing is the uh, logging, and uh, I won't show the logging, but the tracing is in kind of interesting. So tracing is the HTTP tracing. Uh, and in my application, I am, I'm using long polling to get updates for my web page. So this is the long poll endpoint. And then this is the conversation endpoint that where the dialogue flow is calling my conversation endpoint. So you can see all of that stats here. And if you click on the conversation, on the conversation, you see the stats. Um, and you see what else is being called. So if you look at, for example, under here, oop, sorry about that. Under here, we know that the conversation is taking, on average, like 3.3 seconds, and then it's calling dialogue flow app, it's calling conversation, it's, and then there's an exception thrown. We did that, so you can believe me now. Yeah, so it's very useful because I think like doing fun stuff is one thing, but then maintaining applications is very important in production, and Stackdriver really helps for that. All right, so let's see if I have anything else. That's it. That's all I have. So if you want the slides, that's my Twitter. If you want the code, that's the GitHub. And I have one minute, so I can probably take one question. Anyone has any questions? I can't see, so you have to shout. Questions? One, two. All right, no questions then. Well, thanks very much. I'm around, so if you are at the party later today, let's talk. Take care. Thank you.